بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين سيدنا محمد سيد الأولين والآخرين وعلى صحابته ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين والعاقبة للمتقين اللهم اجعلنا منهم يا رب العالمين آمين آمين ثم آمين بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته to you all I pray you're all doing well this evening and welcome to our session a very special session on uh, fasting the pillar of abstinence uh, and we want to uh, reflect a little bit about this pillar uh, and about the reason why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, obligated us to fast uh, and and this brings us to a verse in Surah Al-Baqarah in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuha al-ladheena amanu, kutiba alaykum al-siyamu kama kutiba ala al-ladheena min qablikum la'allakum tattakun. O you possessed of faith, fasting has been prescribed for you as it was prescribed for those who came before you in order that you may uh, have taqwa, in order that you may have taqwa. And so this verse is uh, divided into three or understood in three different segments. Uh, there is, or, or you could say four. Uh, o you who are possessed of faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing those of us who are possessed of faith. And by us, I mean those of mankind uh, who are possessed of faith. Those who already believe in Allah and His Messenger. Those who have already embraced the, the message of the Prophet wasallam. These are the ones uh, who are um, uh, addressed in this verse. That after having accepted the guidance, that this now is an obligation on those who believe. Fasting is prescribed for you. And that's another segment. As it was prescribed for those who came before you. And that's a third segment. In order that you may have taqwa. And that's the fourth segment of this verse. And I want to take this verse into uh, in, in all four segments, inshallah, and really focus on the last of the, of the four. Uh, because we oftentimes ask ourselves, why is it that we do such and such a deed in Islam? What is the purpose behind such and such? Or what is the wisdom behind such and such? And for some things we are told the wisdom, and for some things we are not. Uh, they're, they're, we, are, we are told not to eat pork. And no one knows why. No one knows why uh, we were forbidden from eating pork. And there's nothing in the Qur'an that indicates why uh, uh, that hukum is there, that ruling is there. Now, you may pontificate and say, well, swine is this and swine is that and the, and the nature of the meat and all of this. These are all benefits that, uh, that uh, entail from the ruling, but you cannot call it the illa, you cannot call it the operative cause uh, in the uh, ruling. Like this is why, so that when, when that operative cause is there, the ruling is there, and when that operative cause is no longer there, the ruling is not there. Because if you think that uh, we do not eat pork because of the nature of the, of the meat and its, and its uh, health properties and all of that, well, what if you got to a point where scientifically you could, you could turn swine into uh, healthy food? That swine could actually be become healthy through uh, manipulation and through a certain way of cooking it, right? A certain cooking technique or something like that. Then does it become permissible? Well, no, right? Because the purpose behind the prohibition was not its uh, unsanitary. It, it was not its being unsanitary or its unhealthy. Right, and you cannot take that uh, r that reasoning and and spread it across the board, so that anything else that's unhealthy is also forbidden because swine was forbidden because it was unhealthy. Do you see the implications when we when we try to figure out why the ruling is such? And so, this is to say that some of the rulings in the Quran and some of what the Prophet sallallahu has forbidden to us, we do not know the reasoning behind it. And some of what was obligated uh, upon us, we don't know the reasoning behind it. No matter what, you will never know, nor will I, why Maghrib is three rakahs. Why is it three rakahs when every other prayer is two or four? Why is Maghrib three? 
right? We won't know why, but we pray three rakahs, and no, no matter who comes up with a reason for why it could be, that will not ever change the ruling, because this is what is called ta'abbut, right? This is what is called, uh, th this, these, are, these are rulings that are based in uh, ritual practice, that, that, this is, that the reason is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and He withheld it from mankind. Now, this is not the case with certain rulings in the Qur'an where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala actually gives us the wisdom behind the ruling and we don't have to guess at it, we don't have to try to figure it out. Uh, and if you look at this verse, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala began it saying, Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu, O you who are possessed of faith. Right? And so sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses all of mankind at once and sometimes He addresses those possessed of faith. Right? And for those who are possessed of faith, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls them to a further action that will renew their faith and that will strengthen their faith and that will root their faith. And so this now is that action that fasting is prescribed for you. Right? And so that is what is going to root your faith even more. That is what is going to strengthen your faith uh, all the more. Fasting is prescribed for you. And, and now if you look at this word, kutiba alaykum as siyam Right, kutiba alaykum siyam. That fasting is prescribed for you. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala could have said furida alaykum siyam or ujiba alaykum siyam. Right, that uh, fasting was mandated upon you or it was made obligatory upon you. And in fact, he did by stating that fa fasting is kutiba alayna, that it is prescribed for us. Uh, in, it is synonymous, right? But there is something about kutiba that's a little bit different, right? Kutiba means decreed, but it also means written something that is written. So kataba literally means to write. He wrote kataba. And because of this language, we have a certain, there's a certain connotation in this verse that uh, is different from uh, wujiba or uh, furida alaykum siyam, right? That it was mandatory upon you. And that difference in the connotation is that uh, a doctor, when he writes a prescription for you, right? that same verb is used. And in fact, that's how we translate the verse. Fasting was prescribed for you. And even this word in English, prescribed, has the word scribe in it, right? It means what the doctor wrote, what the doctor wrote, the prescription. It's, it's prescribed, which means that it was written before time, right? It was prescribed. It was prescribed. And so that, that's there even in the, in the English translation. It's a beautiful translation for the word kutiba. Fasting was prescribed for you. And so here it is literally a prescription that is written out for us, which means that fasting is a medicine. It is a medicine, and it is meant to treat our maladies, our spiritual maladies, that there are certain spiritual maladies that we have that we carry with us throughout the year that fasting is there to wipe out. It is there to, uh, to treat and it is there to cure us of, right? And this is the medicine that is prescribed. So fasting is literally a medicine, but it's not just a medicine physically, it's also a medicine spiritually. Right? Uh, because if you want to be healed in your body, one of the best things that you can do is fast. And this is, this is well known. I mean, this is, this is what nutritionists are t telling us day and night. This is what doctors are telling us day and night. They, you know, they say, what are you eating? How, what is your diet? Why, why do you think whenever you go to the doctor with, with, with any, any ailment that the first thing they ask you about is your diet? Right? And this is what the Prophet ﷺ said, that مَا مَلَ أَبْنُ آدَمَ وَيَعَاءً شَرًّا مِنْ بَطْنٍ That the son of Adam has not filled the container more evil than his own stomach. On one occasion, he received a gift from the uh, governor of Egypt. He sent him uh, a slave. He sent him Maria and Qibtiya and her sister. And he also sent, her, sent him وسلم, a doctor. And so the slave he manumitted. Uh, and Maria al Qibtiya, the Prophet ﷺ, accepted her, and she was the, uh, the, the uh, mother of Ibrahim. 
She was the mother of the one child uh, whom the Prophet ﷺ sired uh, uh, outside of uh, his relationship or his marriage uh, to Khadija ta'ala anhu, anha. Uh, and so Ibrahim is buried in Al Baqiyah. He's there, he's buried. We know exactly where he's buried. And so he accepted Maria. And the doctor he sent back to Egypt with a, with a letter. Right with a letter saying, "Nahnu qawmun la na'kulu hatta najua, wa idha akalna la nashba." That we are people who do not eat unless we are hungry, and when we eat, we don't fill our stomachs. And so, in other words, this doctor is not going to have any patients here in Medina. There's going to be nothing for him to do in Medina because we are a disciplined people when it comes to food and drink. And so that's 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 prophetic medicine, and so fasting, right? And and fasting is part of the prophetic uh, uh, regimen. The Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi fasted, and he fasted regularly, and he fasted before and after Ramadan regularly, and so did his companions, his blessed companions, and his family. And even when they were not fasting, they were not they were not consuming the way that you and I consume. Or let me speak for myself, the way that I consume, right? The Prophet ﷺ understood that uh, the, the health of the body was connected to the consumption and the variety of the foods that we eat. And in fact, he, he, he would even, uh, he would even t uh, tell people who had certain physical ailments that you should eat this instead of that, and you should eat that instead of this. And so food is a medicine, but also fasting, the, the abstinence thereof, is also a medicine. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala prescribes this medicine to us, which means that there are certain physical uh, benefits to the fast that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to purify our bodies of all the toxins and all uh, and all of the 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 um, all of the, the the malnutrition that we have all of the and 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 all of the the consumption he he wants to wean us off of that and also and more importantly there are spiritual maladies that the fasting is prescribed uh, for, right? There are spiritual maladies that we carry with us throughout the year. The malady, the, the malady, rancor and enmity and hatred and envy and uh, and uh, um, uh, rashness, uh, the the uh, 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 the the uh, arrogance, right? All of these, all of these come down to what are you eating at some level? What is it that you are eating at some level, right? And so the Prophet ﷺ, for example, he forbade, uh, or it, it, there's this, it's not a prohibition, but the Messenger of Allah ﷺ disliked that we should eat meat every day. Right? And Sayyidina Umar who uh, upheld that, that we should me eat meat every day because it has an effect on our behavior and on our comportment and, and our energy. Right? And then there are certain meats that we are only to eat on occasion. And the Prophet ﷺ preferred the meat of lamb over the meat of camel. Because the meat of lamb, lambs are gentle animals. Camels are arrogant. A camel will spit right in your face, and he'll kick you. He'll kick you into kingdom come if you stand behind a, a camel who's irritable. He'll kick you so far. He'll kick the lights out of you. Right? Camels don't care. Right? And, and it takes a. It's a very difficult task to tame a camel. Right? To 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 domesticate a camel. It's it's it takes an incredibly uh, uh, an, uh, an exorbitant amount of time. To train a camel, so camels are known for their for, for that arrogance, right? And the and, and so you are what you eat. You literally you are what you eat, right? You are what you eat. We say that in English. You are what you eat. The the if whatever your food intake is will determine some of some degree to some degree it will determine your behavior and it will influence your behavior. Let's say, right? And so we know this. We call we call certain foods aphrodisiacs. Right, aphrodisiacs, and and they're known that when you eat them, they increase the the desire for uh, for relations, right? And so, literally, there's a there's a correlation, a direct correlation between what we eat and how we behave, what we eat and how the degree to which we are irritable or angry or rash, um, and and or gentle and understanding and and. Um, and uh, uh, um, carefree even, right? So all of this 
comes down to some level uh, uh, to, to what we're eating. And Imam al-Ghazali, he mentions in his book, uh, he has a whole book on this, Kasr al-Shahwatayn, right? Breaking the two desires. And those two desires are the desire for food and the desire for relations. And there is a direct connection between these two. The, he's, not just, uh, the, he's not just taking any two desires and putting them together, but these are directly correlated so the more and the Prophet ﷺ actually prescribed this to single people who are struggling to get married. He said he prescribed fasting to them. Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. He actually prescribed fasting to them. Uh, and so that that would cut the 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 the, uh, the it would it would curb or it would rein in the uh, the, the the drive. Uh, for for relations, right? It would rein it in, and it will it would it would serve to to um, to uh, bring something else to the soul, right? To occupy the soul, uh, which is which is what it yearns for. It yearns for God. It yearns for God. And the more intake, the less meaning. The more input, the less meaning. And so, this is one of the things that you know that when we eat so much we become lethargic and we don't we don't want to do as much uh in in, in you know it, energy comes comes difficult to us and we don't want to do as much in terms of by way of good deeds or service or anything we just want to lounge all day long and chill right because we, where's the energy the air, it's just been see, sucked right out of you uh, however, when we are fasting, we are lighter on our feet. We're more productive. We're we're you know we're, we're not as distracted by what we're and and food has become such a ritual, right? The 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 buying of food, the preparation of food, the cooking of food, the the cleaning of the dishes after the the, the food, and then preparing for the next meal three or four hours later. And it's a non. It it just never ends. It never ends. Al Hassan al Basri once was once asked, "Mada taqulu fi fi man yakulu wajbatan fil yom?" What do you say about a man who eats once a day? And Hassan al Basri said, "Aklu al Anbiya." That's the diet of prophets. And he said, "Wa wa amma man yakulu wajbatani fil yom?" He said, "Aklu Siddiqin." He said, "That's the that's the uh, the diet of those who affirm the truth of the prophets." He said, "Wa wa amma man yakulu salatha wajbatan fil yom?" He said, "What about the one who eats three times a day, three meals a day?" Day. He said, Ibn Alihi Ma'alafa. He said, build a stable around him, right? Build a stable around him. Because he's living to eat, not eating to live. Right? And and that's and, and we eat at least three times a day. Meals, right? Meals. Uh, you know, full out meals, let alone all of the snacking in between the meals and all of the food contacts that we have with the meals. Right? And so there is a direct cor correlation here between fasting and the health physically and spiritually of the human being, right? There are physical and spiritual, and I dare say our mental health as well, is affected by our food intake at some level, to some degree, to some extent. And so for this, we are, uh, fasting is prescribed for us as a medicine. It's prescribed to us as a medicine. Now, um, the, the, uh, the prescription of this as a medicine was not new to Islam or the Muslims, uh, but this this is this is the Prophet ﷺ was the last to institutionalize fasting as a as a religious practice and ritual among all of the prophets because it was prescribed for those who came before us. And if you look at the world traditions of those who came before us, right, there are there are a number of world traditions. Fasting is a part of every world tradition, right? There's 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 you know fasting the, the you had um, you had among the 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 the, uh, the Hindus they they fast the Buddhists they fast the Jainists they fast right and fasting means different things for different people right the Buddhist in Buddhism fasting is not actually um, uh, recommended so much it's not actually emphasized because uh, 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 Sri was in the 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 jungles and he fasted for four years he fasted and he came out of that four years he fasted straight every day for four years which meant that he would only have water and he would break his fast at the end of the day and whatnot so but for four years and so because his body got uh, acclimated to it he found very little benefit in it 
because he went to an extreme in it. And so fasting, uh, therefore, is not heavily emphasized in Buddhism. In Hinduism, there are many different fasts. They fast on, on certain days of the week, and they fast for, for certain gods as well. There's a fast, uh, th that there's a romantic fast in Hinduism, where the women fast for the prosperity and longevity of their husbands. Right? So that's a beautiful fast, right? That's a beautiful fast. It's a beautiful intention for a fast. Um, the, so the Hindus, they have several different fasts that they engage in. The Jainists have several different fasts that they engage in, one of which, which is the, which is the most extreme of all of the fasts of the Jainists, is what is called Santara, which is fasting to the point of death. Fasting until you... You, you expire from the world, you release the soul itself. And it's not considered suicide, right? It's not, su it's not suicide. It's after a person has led a rich life that, in which he has fulfilled his purpose, and he comes to that understanding that I've fulfilled my purpose, now he is fasting to let go of the world, right? To completely let go of all attachment to the world, even that attachment to his own soul, he lets that go. And so it's called Santara, and it's obviously a very, it's a rare, very extreme fast, uh, and, and who knows if people are engaged in it today. But this is at least uh, 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 one of the practice of the ancients, the ancient Janus. And then you have, uh, in, uh, in the Jewish tradition, you have Yom Kippur, right, which is the fasting of the Day of Atonement. It's fasting for the forgiveness of God. Uh, you have a fasting uh, where, where the bride and the groom, they fast before they, uh, they, they, they get married, right? They're on, the, on, their, on their, uh, the day before they get married among Orthodox communities. There's fasting there. And there's fasting for atonement. There's fasting for for um, uh, for for uh, uh, to to commemorate certain events that happen in their uh, histories, uh, and this is what the Prophet ﷺ found Bani Israel doing in Medina. They he found them fasting, and he said, "Why are you fasting?" They said, "We're fasting because uh, this is the day that commemorates the Exodus, where Moses uh, took us from the land of Egypt, uh, in uh, from from the tyranny of Pharaoh." And so the Prophet ﷺ said, "Nahnu awla bi Musa minkum," that we are more entitled to Moses than you. And so he fasted with them uh, the following year, and he added a day to their fast. And we know the day. It's Ashura, right? It's the day of the, it's the, the, the tenth day of Muharram. And so the Prophet ﷺ fasted that day, and he also added a day to, to show that, yes, Moses belongs to us more than he belongs to any other community. Moses is ours, right? We are more entitled to Moses than anyone. We are more entitled to Jesus than anyone. We are more entitled to uh, all of the prophets, right? Because by accepting the Prophet ﷺ, you accept them all. Whereas any one of those religious communities before, they accept just their prophet and perhaps m most of those, those who came before, but they don't always accept those who come after. Right? So the Jews don't accept Jesus or Muhammad The Christians don't accept uh, the Prophet Muhammad But the Muslims accept everyone who came before. And so we are more entitled. And so this is one of the reasons that, the, that the, in Judaism where you have the fast as well. Um, among Christians, right, they fast to commemorate the 40 days of temptation where Jesus was in the, uh, gar uh, in the uh, wilderness for 40 days and he fasted those 40 days. Um, and so in, among Christians, you have, especially among Catholics, you have Lent, what is, what is called Lent now, and fasting has been ritualized among Catholics. Christians have lost a lot of, a, a lot of these rituals, but, uh, or Protestants have lost a lot of these rituals, but you still find that the Catholics have uh, the, the, the rituals rituals intact. And so uh, they fast. And, 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 but even among Catholics, right, over the, the, the ages and over generations, that form of the fasting has changed. And so Lent, uh, it, when it used to be uh, not, not eating or not drinking and also uh, not speaking, Right, they would not speak as well. And, uh, uh, abstinence from speech was one of the uh, it was one of the practices of the Christians, and and we have a we have a a uh, hint of that, of of the origin of that, in the Quran itself, where Jesus tells his mother, as a newborn, he tells his mother, he's just now born, he says, "La tahzani." Grieve not. Your Lord has provided a rivulet beneath you. 
وَهُزِّي إِلَيْكِ بِجِذْعَ النخلة. And shake toward yourself the trunk of the palm tree. تَسَّاقَتْ عَلَيْكِ رُتُبًا جَرِيَّةً That it will let fall fresh ripe dates upon you. فَكُلِي وَشْرَبِي وَقَرِّي عَيْنًا So eat and drink and cool your eye. فَإِمَّا تَرَيِّنَّا مِنَ الْبَشَرِ أَحَدًا فَقُولِي إِنِّي نَظَرْتُ لِلرَّحْمَانِ صَوْمًا فَلَنْ أُكَلِّمَ الْيَوْمَ إِنْسِيًّا But if you see any human being, say, I have vowed a fast to the Lord of compassion, and today I will not speak to any human being. Right? So after she was eating and after she was drinking, she was full off of dates and water, but she was still considered fasting right, from speech. And among the uh, among the, in the monasteries right and uh, among the, uh, the the nuns as well they they in order to become a priest or a nun you had to go through several uh, a, 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 an extended amount of time i'm not sure how long it was i forgot but an extended amount of time where you can actually you you take a vow of silence a vow of silence and that comes from that vow of Ma maryam Right, that vow of Maryam, that that, and so over time, right, over time we find that Catholics today, uh, some Catholics today will give up chocolate for Lent, or they will give up, um, uh, you know, ice cream for Lent, or they'll give up meat for Lent, or they'll give up something, right? They'll, they'll just they'll designate something that they are that they that they that they desire, a craving that they have, and they'll give that up for Lent, and that is now their fast. Uh, and so we see how that has changed over time. And now we come to the verse in the Quran, in Surah Al-Baqarah, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu kutiba alaykum as-siyamu kama kutiba ala al-ladhina min qablikum la'allakum tattaqoon. La'allakum tattaqoon. And this word la'allakum, uh, we use it among ourselves to mean um, perhaps or maybe. Right, uh, but when Allah, but Allah subhanahu wa taala, when He uses this word in, in reference to Himself, He doesn't mean perhaps. It doesn't mean perhaps there. You can't say perhaps you will, you know, have taqwa, or maybe thereby you will have taqwa. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa taala, when when the word la Allah is used for Allah subhanahu wa taala, when He relates it to Himself, it means in order to, in order to. This is why. This is why. So now we have the why. Now we have the reason. Now we have the purpose. Now we have the wisdom behind the ruling. And that's where we go back to what we began, began this uh, session with when we're speaking about you know, certain acts that we d engage in. We don't have the reasoning behind it. But fasting is not one of those acts because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the reasoning behind the ruling. And that is in order for us to, to experience and to uh, embody and to be characterized by taqwa, right? And so we want to spend a little bit of time on that, taqwa, right? And how in the world is fasting related to taqwa? How in the world is fasting related to taqwa? And what is taqwa? We want to describe what is taqwa, right? We, we need to define what that word is, right? Uh, and so let us begin there. Let us begin there. And then maybe we can spend the rest of the session speaking about how fasting ties into taqwa because it's not, it's not uh, on the surface very obvious, right? You, you have to reflect on that a little bit, right? You got to reflect on that. And before we even get in there, uh, uh, to to the to uh, to to the you know to to discovering what really lies behind that, I just wanted to reflect just a little bit about how this fasting is a pillar of this religion. It is a pillar of this religion, right? Which is which is which is incredible that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala uh, will take. A, an, a non-action like fasting. Fasting is not an action. It's a non-action. And turn that into a pillar upon which this religion is based, without which this religion would collapse. Now, isn't that interesting? Isn't that, isn't that interesting? That in order to have this religion be sustained on these pillars, one of those pillars requires that you don't act as opposed to acting. Because in your inaction, there is great virtue, right? And 
Part of that is that awwalul ibadat is samt, right? The first step of worship is just silence, right? That's what the doctors of the heart tell us. The first act of worship is just silence, just ob observation, silent observation. And the Prophet ﷺ said, As-samtu hukmun wa qaleenun fa'iluhu That silence is wisdom, how few are the wise. Silence is wisdom, how few are the wise. Silence is wisdom, how few are the wise. And so we have these uh, rituals in this religion that, uh, and, and these, these obligations in the religion that call us to action. And we also have the obligation that call us to inaction. right? And fasting then, by not acting, you are allowing, right? you are allowing the soul, that precious soul that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala breathed into you, you are allowing it to stretch forth and reach for the heavens. You are allowing it not to be so stifled, not to be so suppressed. You are allowing it not to be so silenced that when you silence yourself, your soul is you, you, you can begin to hear that faint whisper of the soul that is constantly calling upon its Lord. Allah, 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 Allah. You want your happiness, it's with Allah. You want your contentment in this world, it's with Allah. You want satisfaction, it's with Allah. You want bliss, it's with Allah. You, every, the soul is just constantly reminding and constantly in a state of dhikr. It's constantly in a state of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that soul will beat right through the heart. And you can see with the heart's contraction and expansion, its contraction and expansion, Allah, 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 Allah. That is the dhikr of the heart, right? But you can only hear that with a stethoscope, or you can hear it by just pausing from all the food and all the drink and all of the, the ruckus and all of the argumentation and all of the... You, once, you, once you just eliminate all of that, finally your soul is able to... to you, you, you're able to hear that faint whisper, right? And, th and then it gets louder and it gets louder and it gets louder as you are in the presence of your Lord and you feel that you have literally left this world. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is inviting us into his presence by detachment, through detachment, through abstinence, through takhliya, through getting through, through ridding ourselves before we can have tahliya, which is this adornment, right? So to, by, by ridding ourselves of our vices, we can, uh, we can fill ourselves with these virtues. By ridding our lives of vices, we can fill our lives with virtues. By ridding our tongues and our ears and our eyes with, from their vices, we can fill our tongues and our ears and our eyes with virtue and with virtuous acts and our hearts with virtuous states. Right? Uh, but it, but it, and, and so it becomes a pillar. It becomes a pillar of this religion. Right? Fasting for an entire month is a pillar of this religion. We should really think about that. How going how, how inaction is a pillar of this religion. <laughs> Whereas all of the other pillars are action, right? The shahada, the testimony of faith is on the tongue. The prayer is in the entire body. The giving out of charity is with the hand. The hajj is with the entire body. Fasting, right? Fasting is is just abstinence. It's the pillar of abstinence. Is the pillar of abstaining. You're actually not doing anything with your stomach. We fast with our stomach and with our privates, right? But what is it that we're doing with them? Absolutely nothing at all. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. And just allowing them to rest, just allowing them to rest a little bit, right? From indulging in desire. Indulging in desire. Um, and so this now... Uh, tell, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that it was prescribed for us in order that we have taqwa, right? Taqwa. And this is one of the most un, uh, misunderstood words in the English language that we have today, taqwa. Because we have whitewashed this word to where it, 
it literally doesn't mean anything anymore. It means very little, if anything, anymore. Taqwa, right? Um, and it was a word that was packed full of meaning. Growing up, you know, taqwa was, taqwa was something, that, you know, it was a word that I heard a lot more, to be honest with you. I heard it a lot more growing up, you know, in the 80s and especially in the 90s, right? Taqwa, right? Imam Siraj Wahaj put Masjid al Taqwa on the map, right? And so Taqwa was something we heard all the time. Uh, but, but we don't talk about it very much anymore. We don't talk about Taqwa anymore. Taqwa, right? Uh, when's the last time you really heard, you know, a discourse on this word? Um, and if you were to translate it, how would you translate it, right? By and large, most people nowadays translate it as God consciousness, right? God consciousness, which is a very flowery way of, of, of understanding it uh, and, and, and also whitewashing it, sanitizing it from, from, the, you know, from the, the weight and the imposition that it has, right? Completely, completely stripping it of the onus that it places upon us. Right, uh, because we don't like to be inconvenienced in our practice of religion anymore. Right, uh, and so God consciousness, which is actually the translation that is the proper translation for the word dhikr. Right, dhikr is God consciousness. We translate dhikr as remembrance. Right, which is not, it's not, uh, it's not accurate, because when did the Prophet ﷺ ever forget Allah that he had to remember Him? Right. When did the Sahaba ever forget Allah that they had to remember Him? Those who were, the, you know, the, the inner circle of the Prophet ﷺ. Not all of the Sahaba, you know, but 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 when did that inner circle of the Sahaba, the ten who were promised paradise, right? When did they ever forget Allah Subhanahu wa Taala that they had to remember Him? When did the family of the Prophet ﷺ ever forget Allah that they had to remember Him by engaging in dhikr? Right? So dhikr is literally the consciousness of God. It's bringing the consciousness of God that's already in the heart onto the tongue. That's what it means, dhikr. Right? So it's the consciousness of God that is expressed on the tongue, not the remembrance of God after having forgotten Him. Right? These words have connotation. When we say remembrance of God, right, the connotation there, the, the assumption or the presumption is that uh, we, we're, we're coming out of one state into another. Whereas the dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a natural manifestation of His constant uh, uh, mention in the heart that the heart never stops mentioning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And now the tongue is in harmony with the heart's remembrance of its Lord. That's dhikr. That's God consciousness. Uh, but, but taqwa is something else. Taqwa is something else. When the man came to Umar ibn al-Khattab radiallahu ta'ala anhu, out of the blue, he came to him and he said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, ittaqillah. Ittaqillah. Right? He's not telling him, have some God consciousness. Right? Be conscious of God. <laughs> That's not, and so Umar Radhan begins to weep. He begins to weep. And if taqwa meant have some consciousness of God, why would he have wept like that? Why would he have wept? Right? It taqillah. It it means what it sounds like it means. It taqillah, right? You can't have a word that powerful on the tongue mean uh something that flowery, right? of God consciousness. I mean, that's, that's really a projection. It's really a projection in order to, to make this religion much more palatable to our liking and much more uh, receptive to those whom we might be trying to convince of this, that, or the other, right? But taqwa is something completely different, completely different. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uses this word taqwa. He mentions this word taqwa more than 150 times in his book. It's, it's in the very beginning of, of, of Surah Al-Baqarah. It's in the very beginning of Surah Al-Hudan lin Muttaqeen. It is a guide for those who have taqwa. For those who have taqwa. So let us look upon uh, the meaning of this word taqwa uh, the, in, in terms of its lexical connotation as well as its technical usage in our books and uh, in, the, uh, in the guidance of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Um, and so, um, I just wanted to, uh, before doing that, I just wanted to set the stage, 
for, 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 for what we have here. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us and he has blessed us with the reason why we fast, uh, just as he has blessed us with the reason why we pray. He said uh, in Surah Taha, verse 14, he said, Innani, as, as speak, speaking to Musa alayhi salam, he said, Innani ana Allahu la ilaha illa ana fa'abudni wa aqim salata li dhikri. Right? Indeed, I am Allah. There is no God uh, except me. So worship me and establish the prayer. Lidhikri. And establish the prayer. He didn't leave it there. He didn't just say establish the prayer. He said establish the prayer for my, for, in order to be conscious of me. In order to be conscious of me. Right, so he gives us the reason why we pray. The Prophet ﷺ was commanded, خُذْ مِنْ أَمْوَالِهِمْ صَدَقَةً تُطَهِرُهُمْ وَتُزَكِّيهِمْ بِهَا وَصَلِّ عَلَيْهِمْ إِنَّ صَلَاتَكَ سَكَنٌ لَهُمْ Take from their wealth, take from their wealth charity in order to purify them inwardly and outwardly. He could have said take charity from their wealth and leave it there. But then he says uh, in order to purify them inwardly and outwardly. So we are given the reason why we give in charity. It's for pur purification. The one who gives his, uh, his charity, he gives his wealth in order to purify himself. Right? So this is, we are given the reason in that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and, and, and that verse was in Surah At-Tawbah, verse 103. In Surah Al-Hajj, verse 37, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, <laughs> That uh, the, at, at the point of sacrificing the animal, Right when we sacrifice the animal for Hajj, when we sacrifice the animal, uh, that uh, neither its um, flesh nor its blood reaches Allah. Neither one of these reach Allah. The, the, the flesh doesn't reach Allah, the blood doesn't reach Allah, but the taqwa reaches Allah. The taqwa reaches Allah. Right? And so, uh, you know, so, كَذَلِكَ سَخَّرَهَا لَكُمْ لِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ عَلَى مَا هَدَاكُمْ And for this reason, we have made them, we have subjugated these animals to you. Right? This is why we have subjugated these animals to you. لِتُكَبِّرُوا اللَّهَ In order that you exalt Allah. In order that you exalt Allah. Right, and so the the otherwise it would have Allah subhanahu wa taala he could have left it without giving us the reason, but when we see these animals under our subjugation, that we are rec that we recognize that we exalt our Lord, right, uh, 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 unto whom we are subjugated, right, and then Allah subhanahu wa taala says. Or, or the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith related by Abu Hurairah عنه, that in Allah la yanzuru ila ajsamikum wala ila suwarikum walakin yanzuru ila kulubikum and that was related by Imam Muslim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not look at your bodies or your images but he looks rather uh, at your bodies or your forms but he looks rather at your hearts he looks at your hearts. And so this, this tells us here that, uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in, obli in obligating these things for us, in obligating prayer, and in obligating charity, and in obligating the sacrifice of animals, and in obligating the, the fasting, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala lo is looking into our hearts with all of these obligations because these are all matters of the heart. They are not rituals specifically for the body to engage in and exclusively. They are, body they are rituals that are meant to, uh, to allow the heart to allow the heart to, uh, to, to be free of its spiritual maladies and to be purified and to return to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sound as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has, has gifted them uh, unto us and bequeathed them uh, to us. Um, and so we want to talk now about uh, taqwa, right? And lexically speaking, taqwa comes from three letters, right? The, the three letters from which it comes are uh, waw, qaf, and the alif maqsura, right? Or you could say the ya. Wow, Qaf, and Ya. These are the three letters that uh, are, form the root of 
uh, taqwa. And the wow, the qaf, and the ya are related to a word uh, that is waqaya, right? Everyone say waqaya. Waqaya, right? And waqaya is literally a protection. That is, that is the meaning of waqaya. It's a protection, right? So this is at the essence of the word taqwa. It's at the essence, not consciousness, right? And that's not to say that taqwa is not God consciousness. Of course it's God consciousness. It includes that. But the, the, the connotation of this word at its essence, at its core, is uh, protection, protection. So when they say ittaqillah, right? They're not saying have consciousness of Allah. They're literally saying uh, take between yourself and Allah a protection, right? That, that, that make, make your deeds, make your intentions, make your states, make your, your, your pleading, make your yearning, make your salawat, your rituals, make all your sacrifices, make all your, your virtues, make all of that as though they were a protection uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what that means then is that have some fear of God. Have some fear of God, some healthy fear of God. And that fear of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not the fear of a monster. It is not the fear of a ghoul. It is not the fear of, uh, of the dark. Right? We seek refuge from the evil of the night as it uh, overtakes the sky. That's not that fear. It's not that fear. It's the fear of falling into disgrace with your Lord. It's the fear of bringing shame upon yourself in His presence. It's the fear of falling into disfavor with Him. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's the fear of falling short of his obligations. It's the fear of him finding you where he did not command you to be. And it's the fear of him finding you where he, where he prohibited you from being. Right? It's that fear. Right? Uh, it's that, you know, our, our children, for example, and this, the, 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 this is an analogy right? just to understand. Our children fear, uh, fear us as parents. Right? But what do they fear? Do they fear us the way they fear someone who's going to kidnap them? Do they fear us the way that they're going to fear someone like, like a dog that's going to bark at them and perhaps bite them? Do they fear us the, the same way? Is it that terror that they fear from us? If it is, then, you, then you've, got to, <laughs> you, you, you've, you've got to reassess your parenting. Right? If that's the kind of fear that they're experiencing, right? and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rectify us and rectify our parenting, and 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 uh, and give us uh, wisdom in that, right? And the the way that we speak to our children ultimately becomes their inner voice, right? As one of the as one of the child psychologists said, I, I forget her name. I can't I can't remember her name for the life of me. Um, but this fear of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala is that fear of of estrangement. It's the fear of His not turning toward us. Is the fear of his not accepting us? Is the fear of not exposing ourselves to his forgiveness and to his grace? It's that fear. That's the fear. So protect yourself from falling into disfavor with your Lord. And so the Prophet ﷺ even said, "Ittaqunara walau bishikki tamra." Have uh, take protection from the fire, even if it's with half of a date. Right? And so he's not saying, have consciousness of the fire. <laughs> have consciousness of the fire. He's not saying that. But he's saying, fear the fire. Right? Fear, the, fear the, what, what, could, what could afflict you from the fire. And so uh, even with half of a date. So they said that basically what taqwa is, is it is X protecting himself from Y with Z, right? That's the definition. That's one of the definitions of taqwa, that X protects himself from Y with Z. That is the, that, that is, that's the mathematical, right? We, we, we're talking about a lexical definition of taqwa. This is, the math, this is a mathematical definition of taqwa, right? X protects himself from Y with Z, right? So, what do we have ta when we have taqwa of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? That's not just dhikr, that's not just God consciousness, right? But it's 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 born in action, that it's based in action. There there has to be something that I am going to present to my Lord 
and I am going to present it with the intention of it protecting me from falling into disfavor with him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? Um, and so, uh, even though Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is the one who creates our deeds, uh, but He is also the one who obligates them for us to do, right? And so, um, this is one of the definitions. And so, they said, um, <clears throat> uh, there was a man who asked Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in one narration, and there's other companions who are mentioned in the narration as giving this particular answer, uh, as to what taqwa is. And so Abu Huraira said, uh, Have you ever walked on a thorny path? And the man said, yes. He said, فَكَيْفَ sanat." He said, so what did you do when you took that, for, that, that thorny path? He said, sanat. He said, قَالَ إِذَا رَأَيْتُ الشَّوْكَ عَدَلْتُ عَنْهُ أَوْ جَاوَزْتُهُ أَوْ قَصَرْتُ عَنْهُ قَالَ ذَلِكَ التَّقْوَى He said that if I have ever, if I ever walked on a thorny road, or if I saw thorns in front of me, then basically I would, uh, I would avoid them, right? Or I would try to pass over them, uh, or I would, uh, I would, uh, um, um, uh, 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 you know, like, <laughs> I would step back away from it, right? I would step back away from it. And so this is, so yeah, I, I wouldn't actually go on it. I'd step back away from it, or I'd cross over it, or I'd go around it. And so basically, that's what he's saying. So in other words, I'm not going to, I'm not going to step on, the, on any of those thorns. And then he said, that is taqwa. Right, that is taqwa. He captured it. He captured it, and Ibn Mas'ud, if I'm not mistaken, he said that taqwa is uh, that you walk on a thorny path uh, in a light, in, in in a dark night, in a dark night, uh, with very faint light, and so you you uh, raise your cloth, right, your loincloth. You raise your loincloth or your pants, uh, or or your your dress. You raise that up. So that you you make sure that you're not stepping on anything. You're watching for all the thorns, so that you make sure that you are not harming yourself. And so that is taqwa. And so we have uh, in uh, in this that, that it's to take this protection, right? It's to take this protection. And the uh, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Al-Tahrim, verse number six, He says, "Ya ayyuhaladina amanu." Oh, uh, you possessed of faith, protect yourselves and your families from the fire uh, whose fuel is uh, people and stones, right? So protect yourself from that. So ku, right? Ku literally comes from waqa, and it's the same word that we get from taqwa, is to protect yourself from the, from the fire. That's the meaning here that we even have in the Quranic usage. It means to protect oneself. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah At-Tur, فَمَنَّ اللَّهُ عَلَيْنَا وَوَقَانَ عَذَابَ السَّمُومِ That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has graced us with His favor, and He has saved us from the chastisement of the scorching wind. He saved us from the chastisement. In other words, He protected us therefrom. He saved us. He delivered us from the uh, scorching wind, the chastisement of the scorching wind, a fierce hot wind. And so we have in this uh, word then the meaning of protection through and through. And if you look at a little bit, and this is the last thing I'll say about the lexical definition of this word, that if you take the letters of wow, qaf, ya, right? Wow, qaf, ya. And you switch them around, and what this is known as uh, th this is known as metathesis, or in Arabic qalbul makan. And uh, Imam Al Razi speaks about this in his introduction to his tafsir. Uh, and so, so many of the, the scholars have spoken about this as well, the linguists especially. That if you switch the letters of these words around, that uh, what this does is it creates a, a, a an extended uh, family of semantic meaning right where these words are connected uh, at a at a at a meta level right they're they're connected uh, they're, they're connected at a macro level if you will and so uh, by switching the letters wow qaf ya which means to protect oneself uh, or to protect someone else also um, the the you get qaf wow ya and qaf wow ya is quwa right qawi and quwa is strength, qawi is the strong. And so you can see that even in the language here, you have this, this connectedness between these roots where protection 
has to be strong. And the Prophet ﷺ said that the strong believer is not like the weak believer, right? The strong believer, he is fortified, fortified, right? And he's not like the weak believer who is uh, worshipping Allah on an edge. And you can just blow on him and he, he can fall over, fall over the precipice. Anything he hears or, say, or, or, or anything that happens in the world and he's ready to renege on the faith or he doesn't want anyone to know he's Muslim. And and they'll 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 um, they'll hide their names in a moment, right? They 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 have these beautiful names, right? These very beautiful names. Where Cassius Clay said, you know, what's my name in the ring? What's my name, right? He punished uh, his uh, his opponent in the ring. I forget who it was. It was uh, uh, I don't know if that was Fraser. I I, mean, I don't I don't remember who it was. But he punished him. He punished. Maybe it was Liston. I'm not sure. But he punished him in the ring. What's my name? You are gonna, you are gonna call me Muhammad Ali, right? You are gonna call me Muhammad Ali. That is my name. My name is Muhammad, right? And that was that was uh, revenge uh, after that that interview that they had, right? That was his sweet revenge. What's my name? My name is Muhammad. You say it clearly, right? And clear your throat before saying it. I want to hear it clearly from you, right? Whereas you have people who were gifted that name from birth. And didn't have to learn about that name uh, and, and, and embrace it later on in life, but they were gifted it from birth. You can call me Mo, right? You can call me Mo, right? So uh, basically, I mean, you, you've 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 turned yourself into into a stooge, right? That pun was very much intended. If you got it, you got it, and if you didn't, well, you know, Google it. Um, and so we have the technical definition now of taqwa, the technical definition, the, the, the mustalah. Uh, Al-Raghib said, Al-Raghib al-Isfahani said, Al-Waqaya hifdu shay'i mimma yu'dihi wa yadurruhu. It is, uh, that, oh no, that's, that's actually a lexical definition, uh, so we'll skip that. He said, so, so uh, one of the, the, the technical definitions then, Al-Raghib does say, uh, sorry, uh, so yes, Al-Raghib says, <clears throat> so that so Raghib said that that, that it's it's protection uh, that uh, preserves something from that which harms it, and that's l l lexical. But then he also says uh, in the in the technical definition, he said that it is hifdu nafsi. It is the protection of the soul. Amma yuathim from that which uh, incurs sin upon it. And that is by forsaking what is prohibited. And that becomes perfected by forsaking some of what is even permissible by forsaking some of what is even permissible. لِمَا رُوِيَ الْحَلَالَ بَيِّنْ وَالْحَرَامُ بَيِّنْ Based on the narration of the Prophet ﷺ in which he said that that which is permissible is clear and that which is prohibit, prohibited is clear. وَمَنْ رَتَعَ حَوْلَ الْحِمَى and the one who uh, grazes along the, uh, the, 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 the fences, right? Right, like, like, like you have you have this pasture where you have certain things in the pasture are permissible, certain things are in the pasture are forbidden, and the one who grazes among the, the along the line, right, along the line, woman rata haul al hima fahakikun an yaqa fihi. It is it is inevitable that he will fall into that which is impermissible, which means basically the, the blurry area, the shady area, where you, have, where you have on one hand it's black, on one hand it's white, and then you have a lot of gray in the middle. And if you tote that line, then you're going to fall into that which is impermissible, right? It's inevitable. So what that means then is that taqwa is not merely avoiding that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, it also it becomes perfected when you avoid much of what Allah, or let's not say much, yeah, let's say much, let's not say most, let's say much, much of what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has rendered permissible, permissible, right? That is now, now you're talking about taqwa, because now you're not just talking about um, the wajib and the haram, like that's the question we you know we, we ask all the time. We always ask this question: Is is such and such 
mandatory? Is such and such forbidden? Is it haram? Right? Is it, is it haram? When is the last time you have ever heard someone ask, or you perhaps ask yourself, right? When is the last time you have asked someone, or you have ever heard it asked, is it mandub? Is it makru? Right? Is it recommended? Or is it discouraged? Is it encouraged that I do that? Is, is this what my Lord encourages? Is this, is this what my Prophet encourages? Or is this what my Lord discourages me from doing? Is this what my Prophet discourages me from doing? Right? When is the last time we've actually asked that question? If I gave you a notebook and I say, write down all the obligations in this religion. And then I say, okay, turn a page. Write down all the prohibitions in this religion. A lot of us are going to write down the same exact things. Right? The obligations, we're going to go right into the rituals and also into uh, uh, treating our parents uh, with respect and, 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 and then uh, certain uh, religion, uh, uh, marital obligations of the husband, of the wife, uh, obligations of the children to the parents, obligations of the parents to the children, obligations uh, with respect to, yeah, like we'll, 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 obligations with respect to writing contracts for, you know, obligations with respect to, uh, to, to uh, uh, mostly our rituals and, and a lot of the, uh, a lot of what is what is there in marriage and divorce, family law, um, we're going to write down a lot of what is similar there. The same thing for the prohibitions, uh, what we're prohibited prohibited from eating, drinking, smoking, right? Uh, and, and you know, uh, desires, acting on desires, um, gossip, lying, certain like. Uh, so these are the prohibitions. But then I say, okay, turn the page, write down for me a list of all of the mandubat, or not even all of them. Just give me twenty of them. Uh, give me 20 of the makruhat, 20 things that are mandub or mustahab, uh, encourage, and 20 things that are makru or discouraged or, or, or reprehensible, right? We would be hard-pressed to come up with, what, 10, 5, 3, and speak about with certain that these are, and would they be all the same? Or would they all be different? If I gave the, that assignment to, to, to a group of 50 people, would, would those be as, would they resemble each other? The answers to, that, to those two questions, would they resemble each other uh, in, to any degree that the answers to the first two questions resembled each other about the wajib and the haram? Would, would the, w w w do you see what I'm saying? Do you understand what I'm try trying to get at? And, th and that is where taqwa lies. It lies in, in, that, in those middle two, right? Because if you have wajib, you have wajib, mustahab or mandub, mubah, makru, haram, right? We know the wajib and the haram, that these are the, these are the, 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 the uh, right? These are the outer perimeters, right? And the Prophet said, what's permissible is no you know what's permissible is known and what's impermissible is known right the, 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 this is clear and this is clear but all of that gray area in between all of that gray area in between that the more that we're just like swaying back and forth and we don't even know where we are in that then it's inevitable it's inevitable that there were, that we're going to fall into something that's prohibited right and so taqwa lies in seeking to know and seeking to do what our Lord and our Messenger وسلم, have encouraged us to do and to avoid what they have discouraged us from doing. Right? That's, and so in that, in that, we're going to find that we leave off much of what is even permissible, much of what is even permissible, for fear that, uh, that by, by walking that line, that we might actually fall into what is impermissible, and that is taqwa, because that's part of the thorny patch. It's part of the thorny patch. The makruhat are part of the thorny patch. They're part of the thorny patch. Yeah, they, they, might, they might not be as brazen as the haram when, when the thorns accumulate, but that's where the thorny patch begins. It's where it begins, and we can either we can either walk it and say, you know, I've got I've got thick feet, right? Or I've got you know these these uh, state of the art you know sketcher sandals here. You know, I'm not going to uh, state state of the art, but the <laughs> you know these uh, these uh, you know, and I, I'm not going to you know I'll be all right, I'll be all right. But those sandals will wear out. They'll wear out, and what leads to the haram is likely haram. 
uh, and uh, especially if we make it out and make it into a habit. So this is the the the, um, <clears throat> and so this is what Arnaghib says, right? In in this uh, in this uh, in this vein, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so, so the beautiful thing about this is what I want to do is I want to look at taqwa and I want to look at uh, and answer the question here, what is the relationship between these definitions of taqwa and fasting? And how are these connected? Right? How are these connected? How is fasting connected to taqwa? How does this, how does fasting get me that? Right, uh, and so I think that th that's a very important question to ask because a lot of times when we read that verse, that in it was prescribed for us, fasting was prescribed for us in order that we have taqwa. We're thinking to ourselves, it's because we're abstaining from food, and automatically you're going to have more taqwa, <laughs> or you're abstaining from drink and food, so you're thinking about Allah, and you're going to have some taqwa. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm not eating, right? Uh, so basically, you know, anyone who's dieting is just going to have taqwa. Is that the case, right? Because there's a lot of people who just diet. They fast, right? They fast. Do they all have taqwa, right? And sometimes we fast. And can we, dis can we characterize our days and nights as days and nights the, uh, of taqwa, right? What is it about the fasting that informs taqwa and that, that, that lends itself to taqwa? To this protecting ourselves from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What's the correlation? What's the and so just by that definition that I gave, um, that Raghab al Asfani gave that I just rendered, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Baqarah, now look at this is the connection now. These are the connections that I that I that I'd like to reflect on. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al Baqarah, verse number sixty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kulu wa shrabu mir rizqillah, right? Eat and drink from the pro provision of Allah. Eat and drink from the provision of Allah. And so this is a command to us outside of Ramadan, right? outside of fasting. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to do those things which are permissible for us to do. right? Eat and drink from the provision of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So what does fasting do then? Fasting is a ritual where we are to avoid all that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden, but also what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has otherwise permitted. Do you see the connection there? Do you guys see the connection there? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has actually permitted food and drink. And fasting is a ritual in which we are um, avoiding the permissible. And that is the direct definition that's given by Raghab al-Asfahani and by others about the, 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 uh, the essence of, uh, of taqwa, about what taqwa entails, right? It's, tarkul tark it's not tarkul haram only, it's tarkul halal, al-kathir min al-mubah, right? Al-kathir min al-halal. It's forsaking much of what is uh, permissible and fasting does that. That's exactly what fasting is. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commands us to eat, He commands us to drink, He um, He blesses our engaging our spouses, right? And and this is from one of His signs, and this is one of the things that we are rewarded for, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's Messenger has said that we are rewarded for approaching our husbands and our wives, right? We're rewarded for that. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, in, in fasting, he obligates us to forsake what is permissible. Uh, to forsake what is permissible. Is that not the, the definition of taqwa itself as we have just, um, as we have just uh, covered it? And then uh, uh, on that vein, right, on that vein, uh, Al-Hasan, uh, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said, مَا زَالَتِ التَّقْوَى بِالْمُتَّقِينَ حَتَّى تَرَكُوا مِنَ الْحَلَالِ مَخَافَةَ الْحَرَامِ He says the same thing, that taqwa will be a, a, a characteristic of those who are muttaqin as long, so long as they forsake what is permissible. Not what is forbidden, what is permissible, right? Uh, uh, in addition to what is forbidden, obviously. وَرُوِيَ عَنِ ibn Umar قَالْ إِنِّي لَأُحِبُّ أَنْ أَدْعَى بَيْنِي وَبَيْنَ الْحَرَامِ سِتْرَةً مِنَ الْحَلَالِ لَا أَخْرِقُهَا That I love to put between myself, or between me, and between the haram, 
I like to put a veil between myself and the haram, a veil of what is permissible, right? A veil. So it's almost like a, like a, what do they call it? Uh, it's like a, oh, what do they call this? It's like a, Allahumma salli wa sallam wa barak ali. Uh, you know when you have uh, when you have a person who has an who has a, uh, there's a word for it. It begins with a B. Um, it's not a barrier, but anyway, um, a buffer, a buffer, a buffer, right? So he said that I I like to put a buffer between myself and the haram, and that buffer is that which is halal. Right, so that there's certain things of the halal that I won't do, that that act as a buffer for me, a protection for me, against the haram. So that if I don't get, engage some of what is halal, then I'm definitely not going to engage anything that's haram. Do you guys see what I'm saying? This is the this is the wisdom here of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He's prescribing taqwa for us by an. Uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, ascribing fasting for us in order that we uh, are able to have this protection, right? Um, and so uh, Umar ibn Abdul Aziz said something similar: "Laysa al taqwa, qiyam al layl, wa siyam al nahar, wa taqlid fi ma bayna dalik." He said, "Taqwa is not fasting by day and praying by night, and all of the good deeds that we do between the two. Walakin al taqwa." But taqwa is uh, performing that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has obligated and forsaking that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has forbidden. And so if there is any acts or deeds on top of that, then that is good upon good. Right? And so this is this is um we have many of the same voices now uh, emphasizing that same definition, that definition that we just gave. Uh, and uh, Jurjani in his Mufradat, he defines taqwa in his technical uh, definition as, uh, he says, taqwa fi ta'ati yuradu biha al-ikhlas. That having taqwa in our obedience, uh, what is meant by that is sincerity. Right. He defines taqwa as sincerity in our acts of obedience. And with respect to defiant acts, acts of disobedience, taqwa is abandonment. So for the acts of commission, taqwa is sincerity. And for the acts of omission, taqwa is abandonment, forsaking it. Right, uh, turning your back against it, and uh, we find in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu. So that's the definition of taqwa. Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu said that, that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that kullu amal ibn Adam lahu illa siyam fa innahu li wa ana ajzi bihi. Now look at look at that. He said now now Jurjani said that taqwa in the acts of obedience is sincerity. And uh, Abu Huraira relates this hadith about fasting, where the Prophet ﷺ said that all of our acts, right, all of our acts, we shall have, we shall reap some of the reward and benefit from those acts, except for fasting, because that is strictly for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah says, I reward for it personally, right, that you cannot fake fasting. You can fake anything else and, and have some kind of a, an ulterior, uh, ulterior benefit accrue to you, right? That uh, I've never seen anyone pray like that. I've never seen anyone uh, as philanthropic as he. I've never seen anyone as, as knowledgeable as him. I've never see, heard anyone recite Quran like she, like she can. I've never seen anyone like that. This is all to be seen of men, right? This is all to be seen. Uh, but fasting, who's seeing it? Right? You could easily, you could easily sneak a snicker bar right behind the pantry and, and you know, come out and say, you know, uh, how much more time before Maghrib? You can easily do that. No one would know. No one would know. Kids, don't try this at home, right? Uh, you could easily do that. But you, you, you can't fake fasting. I, you can easily pray for any number of reasons, for any number of reasons. You could you could pray you could seek to pray next to someone just to just to seek status with that person. Like if you if if there was a celebrity who was in the masjid, who just walked in the masjid, 
you know, you, you find that you, you could easily fall into, you know, I just want to pray next to him, right? I want to pray. I want to pray. I just pray anywhere in his vicinity so that maybe if he looks upon me, you know, after the prayer, we can start a conversation or something. Like that. Well, I mean, it's not sincerely for Allah then. You're not praying sincerely for Allah. Right, like that man. He was uh, he was in prayer, and and his prayer was just it was so um, it, it was just so perfect in its form in everything. Right, as he would you know Allahu Akbar, like amazing. Look, like, look at this. Look at the khushua that this man has. Like look at the, the 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 presence. He has this magnificent presence. His focus. His you know, and then he goes into rukua. Right, he goes into his bowing. And he begins to hear the people speaking about him, right? And he's there for he's there for a good two or three minutes. Like we've never even seen anyone, right, bow for so long. And then he turns to everyone and he says, And I'm fasting too. <laughs> right? I mean we <laughs> I'm fasting too, right? <laughs> so, you know, we could, all of our acts, there's something in it for us that we have to, that we have to try to overcome so that we could render it all for the sake of Allah. But fasting is guaranteed. That's for Allah. Fasting is guaranteed for Allah. You know, you can't fast to, because you can always fake the funk with fasting. You can always just, you can always just, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, eat yourself a, a Granny Smith apple or something like that and just come out to the people and say, oh, I forgot, I forgot. I, you know, I, t I ate this whole apple, I forgot I was even fasting, right? So, I mean, you know, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewards for it personally, which means that, uh, as Jurjani is saying, uh, that in acts of commission, fasting, uh, uh, taqwa equates sincerity. And we find that definition permeate in the hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala anhu ardahu. And um, Al-Halimi says, حقيقة التقوى فعل المأمور به والمندوب إليه واجتناب المنهي عنه والمكروه المنزع عنه لأن المراد من التقوى وقاية العبد نفسه من النار. And so uh, he says basically the same that we've been saying, that it's, it's doing what you're commanded and it's uh, uh, avoiding what you've been prohibited from doing. And then Abu Huraira radiallahu anhu again tells us that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, مَن لَمْ يَدَعْ قَوْلَ الزُّورِ وَالْعَمَلَ بِهِ فَلَيْسَ لِلَّهِ حَاجَ أَنْ يَدَعَ طَعَامَهُ وَشَرَابَ Whoever does not forsake false speech and acting thereupon, Allah is in no need of his forsaking food and drink. No? And so this, is, this, is, this falls right into that definition that, uh, that, that we can see the direct link, the direct connection between fasting or abs abstaining and taqwa, how abstinence leads to taqwa, that when you have this, uh, this uh, ethic of, of not avoiding, you know, because taqwa is to avoid what you have been prohibited, and if you are fasting, how can you gossip? If you're fasting, how can you, right? It's because it's not just about the fast. It's not just about uh, not eating or not drinking. That's the very beginning. That's the very, that's the bare minimum of the fast. That's the bare minimum of the fast. That's the fast that, that renders it valid or invalid in the eyes of a jurist, right? But that's not the point of the fast. The point of the fast is taqwa. Right? And so the Prophet has said, if, you, if a person is fasting and giving false speech, false testimony, uh, then, then, then what's the purpose of his fasting? He said, Rubba, Rubba Sa'imin, the Prophet has said, Rubba Sa'imin, Laysa lahu min siyamihi illa al jua, wa Rubba Qa'imin, Rubba Qa'imin, Laysa lahu min qiyamihi illa al uh, sahar. Right? That how many a fasting person has nothing from his fast, gains nothing from his fast except for hunger, and how many a person who is standing at night praying, uh, who benefits nothing of his prayer at night except for restlessness, that he's just, he's just weary and tired, but that's all he's benefited, because basically he has invalidated uh, at, at, at a spiritual level, he has invalidated his fast by his false speech, by his gossiping, by his lying, by his cheating, by his, uh, his, his comportment with others, 
by his um, lashing out at people, by his arguing and by his cursing people out, all of this, right? All of these attributes that are forbidden, that do not, that, that when, when you engage it, you have deprived yourself of taqwa itself. You have no protection against Allah. You have no protection against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And one of the things about this word uh, taqwa, this is fascinating. This is absolutely, absolutely fascinating. We talked about taqwa as being a protection. And we also talked about taqwa as being strength through quwa, right? Quwa, uh, or the qawi, right? The one who is strong. But that's just in the language. That's just in the language. And then these are connected together in the verse of fasting. That fasting was prescribed for you that you may have taqwa. The Prophet wasallam said, As-siyamu junna. Fasting is a shield. Fasting is a shield. He described fasting as a shield, right? In a, in a, in a completely unrelated hadith. Fasting is a shield. And so if the purpose of fasting is taqwa, which is protection, and the Prophet ﷺ tells us that fasting is a shield, then we have a much greater appreciation and understanding for what fasting is and what it means, the essence of this word, right? Uh, and so <clears throat> um, I wanted to share just a couple of uh, examples here of how the prophetic guidance on uh, taqwa uh, conforms to the uh, intended purpose of the fast and how fasting manifests these meanings of taqwa. Uh, and so one of these um, one of these uh, let's see here one of these beautiful beautiful teachings comes from us from Imam Ali salam, who said and he described um, he described taqwa in the following words he said a taqwa right هي الخوف من الجليل والعمل بالتنزيل والقناعة بالقليل والاستعداد ليوم الرحيل. This is the definition of Imam Ali عليه السلام for the word taqwa. These four things, right? And he said it is الخوف من الجليل. It is having fear of the uh, of the Lord of Majesty having fear of the Lord of Majesty. And that's the first word that he used to describe taqwa is fear, right? It's fear. And this is one of these words that we have just completely dropped from our vocabulary. We, we will not, we will not, because it's not, who can you, you know, people, people want to, we want to, we want to water down this, the, 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 the message so much as to make it palatable and receptive to an audience who could otherwise use a healthy dose of fear of God, right? And this is what the soul needs to hear. Not what the person wants to hear, but what the soul needs to hear. And you know, you never know. If you, if you, tell, if you tell a person that, that taqwa is having fear of God, Right, having fear of God, but you explain it, you know, you explain it. You never know. I mean, you know, they might they might oppose you on the spot, but you have planted a seed in their heart that they could actually go back to years from now, and so and, and something happened in their life, and, and they say, you know what, I need I need some fear of God in my life, because I've been on autopilot for way too long, and I have not figured this thing out. So I could use a good, healthy dose of fear of God. And the one person who actually told them, who, who actually, who actually ex uttered, uttered the phrase as a category, like it's a, like it's a conception that, that's, that's permissible to even have, is a Muslim who described the word taqwa to them. Right? Uh, and, and because when we erase these words, we erase with them the category and the conception. And so they no longer exist in our minds even as a category or as a conception, right? And so this is part of the assault on religion is to kill off the words that will uh, invade our comfort zones. Um, 
and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala restore the essence of these meanings on these of these words but part of that means to embrace these words again for what they uh, for what they actually mean and not for what we would like them to mean uh, with our own projections and so he said al khawf min al jalil it is a uh, fear of the lord of majesty and this fear this fear this you recognize that this fasting is between me and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that when we enter into the month when we enter it in uh, when we enter into it we recognize that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has this right upon us to fast and that there are certain things that i cannot do in ramadan there are certain things that i cannot do while fasting that that break my fast and that will completely ruin the experience for, uh, of of the fast and i want this to be accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so it's actually fear that that my fast not might not be expe- accepted by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this is this this will lead a person to having taqwa right this uh, like i want my fasting to be accepted right and so we can see how the word the, the meaning of taqwa actually uh, informs the spirit of the siyam or the fasting wal amalu bitanzil and it is acting upon that which was revealed it was acting it is acting upon that which was revealed which means the quran it's acting upon the quran the 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 the, the commands of the quran the commandments in the quran the prohibitions in the quran uh, and the stories of the quran that are there uh, for archetypal lessons and benefits to be gleaned of gleaned glean to be gleaned and to live by right and so the the shahr ramadan alladhi unzila fihi al quran the, the the month of ramadan is the month in which the quran was revealed in the in the in the month of ramadan what does this month bring us it brings us the quran front stage and center right and so this ummah has even come up with a sunnah a communal sunnah to uh, to to finish reciting the quran from cover to cover right and so this is one of the sunan that the prophet sallallahu didn't prescribe this to us but the the ummah has taken taken this upon itself during ramadan right and to and in ramadan the, the 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 quran was revealed in ramadan right the 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 the, the laylat and qadr is part of ramadan it's part of Ramadan, Laylat al Qadr, right? To to look for Laylat al Qadr. As lay, Ramadan is when Jibreel alayhi salam would come to the Prophet sallallahu to recite the Quran to the Prophet sallallahu to hear the Quran from the Prophet sallallahu right? And so it's the month of the Quran. So he says, "Wal amal bin Tanzil." So we find in the definition of taqwa itself how the month of Siyam or, or the, the month of the Quran is actually um, giving us the the it's hosting right it's hosting these definitions of the word taqwa and it's manifesting these definitions of the word taqwa in all of what ramadan brings us in all the aspects of ramadan there is something that resonates to one of the definitions that we've covered here in the word of taqwa that that all of our imams and all of our scholars and that the prophet sallallahu said about taqwa you will find some manifestation of that definition in the month of ramadan and then he said wal qana'atu bin qalil and it is to be content with little hello right to be content with little what's the relationship there with fasting <laughs> it's glaringly obvious but perhaps not so because we have taken it upon ourselves in the month of Ramadan, our poor, our poor mothers, our poor wives, our poor sisters, that when they, especially our mothers and our wives and our sisters and our daughters, who stand all day long preparing iftar meals, right, for this guest and that guest and this guest and that guest, and, they, and these are banquets, these are Eid dinners, Eid dinners, every single day of Ramadan because you've got all these guests coming in and out like it was a social, like this was a buffet, right? And the whole purpose for it is that the Prophet ﷺ said, whoever man fattara sa'iman falahu ajruhu wa la yanqusu minhu, right? Min ajrihi shay, that whoever breaks the fast of a fasting person shall have his reward without taking anything from his reward, right? And so that's just putting a date in your brother's mouth it's not all you can eat buff you know biryani it's not that 
right? It's not, uh, it's not, it's not, uh, it's not, you know, the, 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 it's, it's, it's none of that. No, it's none of what we do. It's not all the styrofoam that fill canisters upon canisters of trash and, you know, and, and, and the food that gets thrown away in Ramadan on styrofoam, styrofoam plates and styrofoam cups, it is the most wasteful month that we have as an, as an ummah, the most wasteful month. And I'm just speaking from mere experience of, of seeing how Ramadan is, is practiced in our masajid. And alhamdulillah, we have some masajid that are now becoming much more greener. And I've been, I've been calling for years that if you want to eat in the masjid, you bring your own utensils. You bring your own plates, you bring your own cups, you bring your own forks and spoons and knives, and you, br you bring all that and you take it back with you in a plastic bag. Wash it at home. Right, wash it all at home, but but and do that for thirty days. You'll be saving just yourself and your families. You'll be saving about a hundred fifty plates, and 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 three hundred forks and spoons, and knives. Knowing that you're never going to use that, you, you, you're never going to use all three of them. But you, I got my fork, I got my spoon, I got my knife, I got my five napkins. Like like you you ready to go to town, right? Make up for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I've been fasting for God's sake. Right? <laughs> well, if it, was, if it was really for God's sake, then you wouldn't be making up the meals. Right? And, and Imam al Ghazali has a lot to say about that. And so we, we, we you know, al qana'atu bil qalil. He says that this is the definition of taqwa to have contentment with little. Have contentment with little. Because now you can, you can focus, right? You can focus your life's purpose on service and on rendering greatness to your lord and on 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 uh, not being distracted by 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 one of your enemies this world as one of your four enemies uh, and so qana'a bin qalil and ramadan is an opportunity to do that that you're skipping breakfast you're skipping lunch you're just having that one meal and that one meal the purpose for the suhoor, for the pre-dawn meal, is only one thing, to give you strength to fast. That's the only thing, it's just to give you strength to fast and to do the good deeds that you do throughout the day. And the purpose for the iftar is one, is just one, to give you strength to stand in prayer. Because Ramadan is fasting and it's standing. It's siyam and it's qiyam. Right? That's, that's Ramadan. And the purpose for those two meals is just to give you whatever strength you need just to do those two things. Anything, be, anything more than that is you're splurging. Right? You're splurging and you're just making up for... for it's, like, it's, like, it's, like, uh, it's like building this incredible edifice right? and then destroying it once it's built. Like you build it up every day, and then once the night falls, you do, you just completely destroy it, right? Like like have like some of we've heard it said that fasting is supposed to really teach us the meaning of hunger and and what the, what the rest of the world is going through and and you know what, what people what people just even on your street might be going through, right? Uh, you know, it, whatever hunger you experience during the day of fasting. That's the point, right? That's the point. That's the point. That's when that's when you push yourself and you exert yourself even more to sustain that feeling of 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 doing without to subs to sustain the ethic of abstinence throughout the month. And then he said what is ta'adadu liyawm rahil and it is the preparation for the day of departing from this world. And what you've done by fasting, what you've done by fasting is you have literally, you have literally uh, stripped your, you have literally stripped your entire year of sins. You've completely effaced your sins, erased your sins from your books, from, 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 uh, from the past year. The Prophet Wasallam said that uh, from one Ramadan to the next is expiation for what is between the two.
right? And so this is one of the things that fasting brings to us as well. Uh, this is one of the things that fasting uh, uh, um, allows. Uh, at the end of the month, it, it allows us to be able to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the month of Shawwal without a sin to our names. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives all of the sins uh, as long as those cardinal sins are avoided, which require tawbah. They, those, those require uh, turning to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeking forgiveness specifically for them. Uh, but f just by virtue of fasting, you have completely, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, all of those sins, those minor sins, they're all wiped away. Um, and so you've literally prepared yourself for the next life. Right? Then you've prepared yourself for standing before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, in, in a state that is pleasing to Allah with a, with a sound heart. Um, I have quite a bit more to get through, um, and I fear uh, from, from the length of our uh, discussion tonight, I fear that uh, I may be chasing you away if I went through all of it. But uh, Imam Ali alayhi salam, he said, خَيْرُ الْكَلَامِ مَا قَلَّ وَدَلْ The best of uh, speech is that which is short and to the point. And so I would like to just uh, bring things to an end here uh, because I have been quite verbose this evening. Uh, and so let us, uh, let us uh, close here, inshallah. And um, what we want to uh, just announce to you all is that tonight was the opening session uh, for our retreat uh, on Ramadan. It was a preliminary session. Let's not call it an opening session. It was the preliminary session to just get us prepared for what is to come uh, uh, this uh, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, April 9th through the 11th. We're going to be uh, studying the Book of Fasting by Imam al-Ghazali, uh, and we're going to read it line by line and finish the entire Book of Fasting in three days. Uh, and one of those days we're also, we're also going to dedicate to uh, the Prophet's fast, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, as preserved in the uh, schools of Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik and Imam Shafi'i. Uh, and so we have uh, two scholars who will be teaching along uh, your tr yours truly, with yours truly, the faqir. Um, one scholar is going to be teaching the Shafi'i madhab and the other scholar is going to teach the Hanafi madhab. And you're stuck with me for the uh, Maliki madhab. Uh, and then we also have uh, our very esteemed reciter, Quran reciter, uh, Sidi Muhammad Samir, who may be reciting for us throughout the, uh, the weekend as well. Um, and that is going to lead us then to uh, a month-long uh, program on the Quran. Uh, and we call it Night Journeys. Uh, and so what we're going to do with the reciter whom I just mentioned, uh, he will be reciting in Arabic, and I will be translating verse by verse in English and I'll be reading a translation, it won't be my translation obviously, but I'll be reading uh, the translation verse by verse. So he'll recite one Arabic verse, I'll recite one, uh, I'll translate that verse into English. Uh, and so you get in real time, you're able to connect to the meaning of what you've just heard in the Arabic. And so we're going to do that throughout the entire month of Ramadan. Uh, and uh, the, the schedule and program details, all of that uh, is available to you at lanterna.com forward slash Ramadan. And so uh, with that, let us uh, close. Allahumma salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad fil awaleen. Wa salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad fil akhirin. Wa salli wa sallim wa barak ala Sayyidina Muhammad fil mala il a'la ila yawm al-deen. Wa sallim tasliman kathiran kathira. Wa al-asri inna l-insana lafi khusr. Illa al-lazina amanu wa aminu al-salihat. Wa tawasaw bil haqqi wa tawasaw bil sabr. And uh, it is our habit that uh, we recite Surah Al-Mulk every single evening at 9 o'clock Eastern Time. Uh, tonight we delayed that because of this session, uh, but you are more than welcome to join us uh, every uh, evening at 9 p.m. We just finished our one-year anniversary of not missing a single night of the recitation of Surah Al-Mulk. We have a beautiful family. Many of uh, the family is here with us on this uh, Zoom call. And so we have a beautiful gathering of souls uh, for the recitation of Surah Al-Mulk every night. And we invite you all uh, to partake in that. And what we're going to do now is actually recite Surah Al-Mulk together uh, as um, and um, and inshallah, you're welcome to join us beginning tomorrow at nine. Uh, but before we do that, let me just uh, mig <coughs> migrate over here to see if there are any uh, questions. Um, uh, 
Okay, there are no questions. I don't find any questions here, and it, it is quite late, and so let's uh, let's go right to the recitation of Surah Al-Mulk, inshallah. Let me just bring it up here on my end. And I just wanted to make sure that uh, the share goes through. So if you can just confirm for me that you can actually see this. <clears throat> I'm going to try to share this. Bismillah. So please let me know in the chat if you can see this. We can see it now. Let me, get to, let me open up the chat here and just let me know if you can actually see Surat al-Mulk being shared. Okay, very good, very good. So let us begin with the recitation of Surat al-Mulk. And this is with the intention and, uh, and, and uh, um, aspiration of reviving the sunnah of the Prophet wasallam, who said that there are 30 verses that he wished would be in the hearts of every faithful person. Uh, Hallowed be the one in whose hand is dominion, who has power over all things. And that is the first verse of Surah Al-Mulk. This is a surah that the Prophet wasallam, wished would be in our hearts. And so we gather every evening, uh, if but to fulfill his wish. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. May Allah subhanahu Ta'ala accept its recitation from us and from you this evening. A'udhu billahi minash shaitanir rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Tabarakal ladhi biyadihi al-mulku wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadeer. الذي خلق الموت والحياة ليبلوكم أيكم أحسن عملا وهو العزيز الغفور الذي خلق سبع سماوات طباقا ما ترى في خلق الرحمن من تفاوت فارجع البصر هل ترى من فطور ثم ارجع البصر كرتين ينقلب إليك البصر خاسئا وهو حسير ولقد زينا السماء الدنيا بمصابيح وجعلناها رجوما للشياطين وأعتدنا لهم عذاب السعير وللذين كفروا بربهم عذاب جهنم وبئس المصير إذا ألقوا فيها سمعوا لها شهيقا وهي تفور تكاد تميز من الغيظ كلما ألقي فيها فوج سألهم خزنتها ألم يأتكم نذير قالوا بلى قد جاءنا نذير فكذبنا وقلنا ما نزل الله من شيء إن أنتم إن أنتم إلا في ضلال كبير وقالوا لو كنا نسمع أو نعقل ما كنا في أصحاب السعير فاعترفوا بذنبهم فسحقا لأصحاب السعير إن الذين يخشون ربهم بالغيب لهم مغفرة وأجر كبير وأسروا قولكم أو جهروا به إنه عليم بذات الصدور ألا يعلم من خلق وهو اللطيف الخبير هو الذي جعل لكم الأرض ذلولا فامشوا في مناكبها وكلوا من رزقه وإليه النشور أأمنتم من في السماء أن يخسف بكم الأرض فإذا هي تمور أم أمنتم من في السماء أن 
أُرْسِلَ عَلَيْكُمْ حَاصِبًا فَسَتَعْلَمُونَ كَيْفَ نَذِيرٌ وَلَقَدْ كَذَّبَ الَّذِينَ مِنْ قَبْلِهِمْ فَكَيْفَ كَانَ نَكِيرٌ أَوَلَمْ يَرَوْا إِلَى الطَّيْرِ فَوْقَهُمْ صَافَّاتٍ وَيَقْبِضْنَ مَا يُمْسِكُهُنَّ إِلَّا الرَّحْمَنِ إِنَّهُ بِكُلِّ شَيْءٍ بَصِيرٌ أَمَّنْ هَذَا الَّذِي هُوَ جُنْدٌ لَكُمْ يَنْصُرُكُمْ مِنْ دُونِ الرَّحْمَنِ إن الكافرون إلا في غرور أم من هذا الذي يرزقكم إن أمسك رزقه بل لجوا في عتو ونفور أفمن يمشي مكبا على وجهه أهدا أم من يمشي سويا على صراط مستقيم قل هو الذي أنشأكم وجعل لكم السمع والأبصار والأفئدة قليلا ما تشكرون قل هو الذي ذرأكم في الأرض وإليه تحشرون ويقولون متى هذا الوعد إن كنتم صادقين قل إنما العلم عند الله وإنما أنا نذير مبين فلما رأوه زلفة سيئت وجوه الذين كفروا وقيل هذا الذي كنتم به تدعون قل أرأيتم إن أهلكني الله ومن معي أو رحمنا فمن يجير الكافرين من عذاب أليم قل هو الرحمن آمنا به وعليه توكلنا فستعلمون من هو في ضلال مبين قل أرأيتم إن أصبح ماءكم غورا فمن يأتيكم بماء معين صدق الله العظيم May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept the recitation of Surah Al-Mulk from us all. And uh, just, uh, I, I didn't mention that we we, we meet uh, every night at 9 p.m. at uh, lanterna.com forward slash mulk. Lanterna.com forward slash mulk. And you can join our recitation there at uh, 9 o'clock every evening at uh, Eastern Time for the recitation of Surah Al-Mulk. And you can also follow us on YouTube at the same time. It's the same exact feed. You can either follow it from YouTube or from Lanterna's website, uh, whichever uh, you prefer. And so with that, inshallah, uh, we bid you all farewell. I look forward to uh, having you all at uh, the retreat that's coming up here, uh, the Sustenance of Souls. Uh, and that is, uh, that is the three-day retreat followed by uh, the uh, night journeys through the Qur'an, an entire month-long program uh, on, uh, for, uh, for, for Ramadan in which we will gather uh, for Qur'an reflections. We'll, we'll have reflections on the juz that we're uh, covering. We'll also have the Arabic recitation and the English translation uh, as well. And so uh, that, that's all part of the same retreat. It's, it's, it's literally a month-long retreat. Uh, and so we hope, for, uh, we hope to see you there. And uh, all the program details uh, are there at lanterna.com forward slash Ramadan. You'll find all the, uh, the uh, program details. And, and there's also a, a, an interesting little uh, FAQ section as well. If you have any questions, most likely your questions uh, will be answered uh, through that FAQ section. And you're more than welcome to write us uh, with further inquiries at info at lanterna.com. All of our sessions, including this session, 
are archived at youtube.com forward slash lanterna uh, and the uh, sessions for the retreat will also be archived there uh, and uh, that will be through a private uh, YouTube playlist uh, for the registrants uh, but we're also going to have part of our uh, retreat open to the public throughout the entire month of Ramadan because we want to bring people to the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we want them to experience the Quran with meaning so my reflections will be for those who have attended the retreat and uh, the Arabic recitation and the translation will be open to the public inshallah and we're going to be broadcasting on Facebook and perhaps on YouTube as well uh, throughout the entire month inshallah and with that I look forward to seeing you uh, this Friday and this Friday's session also is open to the public so if you'd like to bring a friend or family member anyone whom you think could uh, benefit from uh, what uh, Imam al-Ghazali has in store for us uh, because he will be the teacher and uh, yours truly I will be uh, literally just the interpreter we're going to hear from Imam al-Ghazali throughout the entire uh, weekend and we are hosting him and he's going to be the one who is going to be teaching us and so if you feel that there's anyone in your family or among your friends who can benefit from his teaching then we would like to invite you to attend the very first uh, night of the retreat which is this Friday and the schedule is there at, uh, at the website lanterna.com forward slash Ramadan with that uh, I bid the all farewell Jazakumullahu khairan it's been an honor to be with you this evening and we pray to see you uh, on the other side uh, Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh